not call him your old man. <laughs> and you could not call mom the old woman or old lady. Uh, that was absolutely a no-no. And uh, so I said, I, I like the song, but I have to apologize for the, for the, one, the one terminology that he would not have, not have allowed. Uh, any praise reports this morning that you have? Anything good happen you want to share with us? until they had to take us. <laughs> and that was first grade. They probably didn't want us then, but uh, prayer requests from 10 member Heidi, uh, Dan and Paula's daughter is recovering. Also Donna and Maddie's here, recovering from surgery. Uh, continue to member Wilma Lohman, uh, Dave's grandma. She's still in the hospital, is she? So remember her, she had surgery with the broken wrist and hip. Uh, yeah, Kevin? Uh, I just I want to praise that uh, we got towed. We got there in bad shape because of South Carolina. But uh, the second day we were down there, uh, it was almost diverted. Uh, went like four or five miles away to just go to the, the uh, grocery store. And went around a turn, just stealing it to 55. A guy was on my shoulder around a blind curve and just last second whipped it off the road and skidded away and he kept going. So just want to pray for that. Amen. Amen. Got away from that. Amen. And uh, yeah. yeah for sure. How many times has God just let us barely get away from something that could be disastrous? Anything else? Remember to pray for um, those ones. We put pinwheels in the yards uh, as a one this week, and the pinwheel is still there. Uh, continue to pray for those. It says Dixonville Church is praying for you. Let's be praying for those that have them. Also, if you have neighbors who have kids or uh, somebody you want to put in there, please do those. Uh, there's still there's still some down in the back uh, for you to uh, pick up if you want to do that. Um, Bring some cheer to somebody uh, going through this time. Uh, any other prayer requests? Remember my daughter in law, Cecilia Rick? Yes. They put her home with Tylenol. Got the old Ooh. broken bone. Okay, remember Butch's daughter in law with after the wreck. Any other? My sister Tracy, she just seems like she's getting more setbacks. So just keep her in your prayers. And mom was really confused this week. They don't know if she had maybe a little mini stroke over the weekend, but she was very. Yes. My brother Dennis is having another heart catheterization tomorrow and possibly open heart surgery. Oh, wow. Okay, remember him. I thought he couldn't have no more. Well, they changed it's, very, it's very risky. Okay, okay. Remember, remember Dennis in that. Any others? For my friend Brianna Dixon, um, she lost her husband last Sunday very tragically. So just for yeah. the young children. So yeah. just for now. Remember that one in prayer. says that they are being unlocked the 3rd of July. And so the 4th of July will truly be freedom for those in Crystal Walk. Because for the first time they'll be able to be out since March the 20th. Uh, she has it down to the day. And, uh, so remember Gladys. Thank you for those who have sent her cards and encouraged her and sent her flowers. 
she was telling me how happy she was. Somebody from the church sent her flowers, and they were all sitting around, and they're bringing them in. She sees them, how beautiful they are, and she wondered who's going to get those flowers, and they brought them to her. And she truly was tickled to death. Oh. I don't know who sent her those flowers, but that was the best thing you could have done. She, my, I was talking to my mother-in-law, who's over there, too, and she said Gladys was just as happy with those flowers as she could possibly be. Yes. Yeah, she was she telling. said that was the first bouquet of flowers she ever bought. Oh, no. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you all for thinking about one another. Okay, Rodney will come and sing our prayer for us. I was going to make mention, Pastor already did step on my toes on his mentor. But, you know, we bring the, our prayer request to the congregation, the brothers and sisters in Christ, and we pray about things. But the one step further, the Pastor mentioned it, some people send cards and send things. And uh, I recently, this past week, too, got uh, a response from my brother. He said, I received a card from the church. Okay, and in this case, it was Debbie. And I know some of you are famous for sending out cards, but man, that, that goes a long way. It's one step further in our prayer that people know we're thinking about them. So if we could just get ourselves into that habit of thinking of others, sending out those cards and responses, it goes a long ways. Standing, if you would, for our prayer course, and as always, our altars are open for the special needs and concerns in our hearts. sisters to lift up one another, to help bear one another's burdens by sending cards and gifts and lifting those up that, that can't get out. Father, help us to continue, Lord, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Lord, we are all that you've got here through your Holy Spirit to magnify your name, to glorify you in the eyes of others because of what we do. Father, we praise you this morning for your goodness. We ask you to hear these requests, Lord, for Tracy and for Ruth Martin, Lord, that you would touch them, strengthen them, lift them up. Continue to help those who come through surgery like Wilda, Lord, and give her strength to prepare her body, lift up her spirits, Lord, and Don and Heidi, Lord, and others who have just come through surgery. Give them your healing touch for Butch's daughter-in-law. Touch her, Lord, strengthen her, Lord. Take away the pain, Lord, that she needs. Father, we pray that you should hear each request, Lord, especially help that young mother with the children who's lost her husband. Father, be the comfort and strength that she needs. Help her, Lord, through this time like no one else can. We pray for those who have twirling pinwheels in their yard that testifies that Dixonville Church is praying for them. Help those, Lord, we pray in a special way. Especially help the one, Lord, who's lost their home in a fire, Lord, that we simply would pray for them. Lord, we pray for them now, especially, Lord. You know what they've gone through. You knew in advance the trauma they would be through, and you knew they needed our prayers, Father. So we lift them up in a special way that you would comfort them and strengthen them and help them, bless them. Lord, for each unspoken request, Lord, that wasn't even given today, we pray that you would hear those as well. For you hear them, Lord. Intervene, we pray. 
Lord, for each request, Father, we've forgotten. You understand and you hear. Lord, speak through your word. Speak your manna from heaven, Lord, that we need. Feed our hearts, feed our souls, we pray. Feed our minds in Jesus' name. So good to hear the kids downstairs. Uh, we'll be talking about opening up Sunday school and going to junior church. And, uh, Ray said that there were some kids that Jody would love to socially distance. <laughs> I thought that was a little humorous, but probably a lot of truth. <laughs> How to talk to God, it sounds so elementary, and yet we don't talk much about it. We've been around the church all of our life, we think about it. Uh, we do it, but we don't explain it very well. So we want to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, you can look at that. I want you to, it's going to be what I want you to memorize as well. I want it to be in you. Not just that we think about here, but something that's actually in us. Like the 23rd Psalm. And I still have candy bars for the 23rd Psalm. I had someone this week that uh, did it. Uh, continue. I want that. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. And we can only have them abiding in us when we memorize and we meditate on those. So I will, I'll give a candy bar as well for anybody who can memorize the Lord's Prayer. And whichever, if you want to cheat, Luke's version is shorter. But Matthew's is the one I want to go with. It's a little longer. It explains a little more. Four-year-old boy was asked to give the meal before the blessing. The family members bowed their head in expectation. He begins to pray by thanking God for everything. All of his friends, naming them one by one. He thanked God for mommy and daddy and for sister and for brother and for grandma and grandpa and all his aunts and all his uncles. 
And he began to thank God for the food. He thanked God for the turkey and for the dressing and for the cranberry sauce and the fruit salad and the pies and the cakes and even the corn. And then he paused. And he paused. And he paused. And we're waiting. What is he waiting on? Finally, he looks up at his mother and says, do you think if I thank God for the broccoli, God went on the line? <laughs> How do we pray? Jesus said this. In this, let, let's all let's all stand and say this together. Pray it together. Um, this is the I think the New King James version, um, and you'll find me slipping into the King James when I've learned it. Uh, and so if my English isn't right. Uh, I put R for art, and then that makes the whole sentence wrong. So, um, Jesus said, In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Uh, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now this is out of, out of Romans chapter 8, and it goes along with us, and it says this. Let's read it. Let's just read it slowly and listen to what it says. For the spirit that God has given you does not make you slaves and cause you to be afraid. Instead, the Spirit makes you God's children, and by the Spirit's power, we cry out to God, Father, my Father, or Abba Father, if you look at another translation. Uh, let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us to understand this whole idea and concept of Father. Open our minds, open our spirits, Lord, feed us from heaven today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I thought I had my great big Bible up here with big print, but all I have is this. And so maybe I'll be able to remember it. Uh, one father told how his, his daughter was asking school to write, some, write a paper about somebody who is the most uh, important person that you know. And she chose him. He said, honey, why did you choose me for your paper? And he was waiting to hear this great and glorious answer. And she said, because I couldn't spell Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Sometimes that's what we get for asking questions. <laughs> Probably everyone prays sometimes to someone when you're in need of help that earth can't give you. But how do we know if we're doing it right or praying to the right being? Who's even qualified to tell us how to pray? Who did it or does it better than anyone else? We have to know. Our desperate situations in life demands it. Our sanity requires it. Our worry requires it. Our anxiety and stress require it. Nothing is more important in life than prayer. Nothing is more important to our inner peace that we desperately need than prayer. In fact, one pastor called the Lord's Prayer um, the path to inner peace. Now, you can go on the internet and find a way to get to inner peace if you want a shortcut that may or may not work. Here are the products and services that offer inner peace, according to them. Aromatherapy, organic potato chips, I'm not sure how that one works. Funeral services, candles, a plumbing warranty, that'll give you inner peace. Bank draft over protection, bank over draft protection, I guess. Yoga, herbs, cancer insurance, car alarms, even mood rings promise inner peace. But it's not quite that easy. And few people really experience inner peace. Most of the time they're regretting their past worrying about their future, and destroying the present. Let's find the inner peace that comes from the Lord's Prayer. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, Luke puts a context to this that Matthew doesn't give. Uh, both of them record the Lord's Prayer 
But Luke says this. He said Jesus, so he was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. It was the way that Jesus prayed uniquely, drastically different, that they begged, Lord, teach us to pray. That was their cry. And Jesus has the one point that he wants to give. This is bouncing a little bit on me. Maybe it's just me. Uh, Jesus has this point. He invites you to become part of his family. Jesus invites you to his family. He says, our Father, who art in heaven, if you look at the King James, or who are who is in heaven, I think that's what are. But we have to understand before Jesus came the Old Testament idea of God. In the Old Testament, before Jesus came, he was creator of everything, heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. He was the Almighty, he was holy, he was transcendent, so far above them. He was eternal, with no beginning, all knowing. But the idea of God Almighty being Father was pretty much foreign to the Old Testament. Only 14 times did they ever use it, and most of those are symbolic and just metaphorical allusions. They're not really used that way. In the Old Testament, God was almost unapproachable for the common man. You had to go through a priest or a prophet if you wanted to talk to God. You had to go to the temple to talk to God. But when Jesus came, he changed all that. Now, there was one scripture in the Old Testament that gives us a peek into what Jesus would reveal when he came. And that's in Psalms 103, 13, where it says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Jesus came to introduce us to God as father. God as father. Because in the New Testament, as we said in the Old Testament, only 14 times. But in the New Testament, Father is used for God. Jesus used it 15 times in just his Sermon on the Mount. 40 times in Matthew's Gospel. And 170 times in the New Testament. And every single prayer that Jesus prayed on earth that's recorded began with this. Father. Father. And then he prayed. Every prayer, except one. Do you know what that one prayer was? The one prayer that he did not use that was on the cross. When he prayed Psalms 22 and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, the disciples did not know when Jesus began teaching them this prayer, Our Father in heaven, they didn't know the price it would cost. For them to become children of God and him to be their father. They didn't know what it would cost. Jesus looking ahead knew what it would cost. And in that one place he didn't refer to God as father. Was the one place where he was paying the price. That you could all become part of the family of God. There was a price to be paid. There was a cost. And Jesus was going to pay that cost. And he did. The price to the entrance of the family of God was Jesus dying on a cross, taking your sins and my sins there to die and take the punishment for us and rise again so that we can live with him forever. He invites us into his family and he tells us how to pray. He came to introduce God as Father. When you address God, how do you address him? What title do you use? What name do you use? And none of them are necessarily wrong. Remember what the Indians used to call God? Anyone? The Great Spirit was what they was the term they used. And so they saw him as being transcendent, the Great Spirit so far above. Jesus says, through him we can call God Father. And when I thought about this, for this message, and, and I thought about the idea of our Father. I think, why did Jesus say, pray like this, pray our Father who is in heaven? Why didn't he just say, my Father who is in heaven? Why did he use plural? Why did he say our? And as I thought about it, my first thought was, 
Perhaps he's talking about the disciples and he's teaching them together so as a group and he's saying, all together he is our Father in heaven. And I thought we pray it today and say our Father because the whole body of Christ is together and together he is our Father. And so we use it in a plural sense of it's not, it's not just me and Jesus and not the rest of you. It's all of us together, the body of Christ, our Father in heaven. But the more I looked, that probably wasn't the primary thing Jesus was doing. Primarily, Jesus was inviting us into his family. He was letting us pray like only he could pray. No one else could really pray honestly, with integrity, and say, Our Father, except Jesus. There was no one who was father to him, who was a father except Jesus. He was the only begotten son, the only son of God. And no one can say and pray, saying father. We can say eternal God, everlasting father. You know, we, we can do everything but really the father part, creator God. But Jesus just simply said our father. Then he says, I'm going to let you pray the way I do. I'm going to invite you in to pray the same way I pray. You're going to be part of my family. I'm going to let you pray like Jesus prays. The one who came from heaven to tell us about God says, here's how you pray. Pray like I pray. I'm going to let you have my credit card. I'm going to let you pray on my credit. I'll let you pray on my behalf. I'll let you pray with my access code to heaven. He said, I want you to be part of my family to the point that you can say, Our Father in heaven, as you begin your prayers. Not our Father on earth. We all have human father. He's our Father in heaven. I remember this is, I was in elementary school. I don't know how I can remember that far back. But it was in the boys' bathroom uh, in elementary school. I can, I can still remember, still, still, still see it. Um, and one of my little friends named Clarence had just gone through catechism in the Catholic Church there and in that he had learned this idea that God the creator was our father and that means we're brothers and I remember that unique experience and why I remember I don't know I can't remember what I had yesterday for, for lunch but I remember elementary school and him saying about we're brothers because God is our father and how unique and wonderful that was. I didn't really understand the concept at that point completely, but I did like it. God is our Father. That's what Jesus came to tell us. Or that He could be our Father. But then He invites us into a better understanding of God as Father. When I say Father, what do you think? What's the ideas that come to your mind? What's, what's, the, what's the things you talk about as father? Where do you get your idea of what the concept of a father is? Mostly by our human father. And if that was a good father, that's wonderful. Sometimes it isn't always the best. We primarily understand what father means by our own experience, good or bad. And as good as our fathers may have been, and we honor them today for all the good things they've done and wonderful things, they all had flaws. I thought my dad was perfect, and yet there were flaws. His impatience was probably one of those that he passed on to me. Uh, God bless him for that. <laughs> but but we, as, as wonderful as they were, they had imperfections. God is a perfect father, Jesus says, but you have to get past your first flawed understanding what a father is before we can understand the perfect father that Jesus comes to introduce. We honor our fathers today, but some of them may have been distant, they may have been harsh, may have been critical at times, may have been absent, they may have been verbally or physically abusive, some even worse than that. But that's what we knew about fathers. Reba McIntyre wrote a song. It's very sad. It says, The greatest man I never knew. And it says, The greatest man I never knew lived just down the hall. And every day we'd say hello, but we never touched at all. 
He was in his paper, I was in my room. How was I to know he thought I hung the moon? The greatest man I never knew came home at late every night. He never had much to say, too much was on his mind. I never really knew him, oh, but now it seems so sad. Everything he gave us took all that he had. Then the days turned to years and the memories to black and white. He grew cold like an old winter wind blowing across my life. The greatest words I never heard, I guess I'll never hear. The man I thought could never die has been dead for almost a year. He was good at business, and there was business left to do. He never said he loved me. I guess he thought I knew. So sometimes our idea of father, when we say those, don't always bring up the best connotations. For those who've had wonderful fathers, you are blessed in that that's our introduction to God, is by our human father. But we can get beyond that because Jesus came for a heavenly father to tell us about. He said our heavenly father is a caring father, regardless of what our father was. He says compassion, as we said, to those who honor him. He just cast all your anxiety on him because God cares for you. God cares for you. In Matthew's gospel here, it says, so don't worry when you say, what should we eat or what should we wear? He says, your heavenly father knows you already need those things. Do you know him as Father? There was a wonderful, wonderful book that uh, Larry Lee refers to. We often, as Christians, we have heard this idea of God as Father so long that it's an empty phrase to us. We don't really get it. How wonderful, how amazing, how glorious it is. Look through the eyes of someone from Pakistan. The idea of Father as God was totally foreign. Her name is Madame Delquiz Shakia, and she shares her story. She writes her book called, I Dared to Call Him Father. For 700 years, her family was a Muslim family that lived in the, the heights of Pakistan. They were upper echelon. They were the high, high class. But she was frustrated and restless in her search for spiritual reality through the Muslim religion. And she asked her chauffeur, who was a Christian, to get her a Bible. Now that could mean death if you did that. But somehow he had the courage and got her a cheaply bound little Bible. Later, Madame Sheikah, as she flipped open the strange book that seemed so important to Christians. And she flipped it open and it said this in Romans 9. I will call... That my people, which was not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. The words puzzled her because the Muslim's holy book, the Quran, states that God has no children. So she continued to read the Bible and the Quran side by side for the next few days. Her young grandson became ill and was sent to the hospital, a nearby Catholic hospital. And she had the Bible with her as well as the Quran. And a nurse there at the Catholic hospital said, why are you carrying a Bible? And she honestly said, I am earnestly in search of God. She said, I'm confused about your faith. You seem to make God, I don't know, so personal. And the nurse there says, just talk to God as if he were your father. After her grandson was discharged, she went back to her home and went to her bedroom, got on her knees, and she tried to call God Father. But she was afraid it would be sinful to bring the great one down to such her own level. Later that night, she remembered her own beloved father who had a high position in government, and yet he always had time for her. He always answered her questions. He was always loving to her. And she thought, if my dad could be like that, maybe God 
and be like that. And she said she went into her room and she got on her knees and she called God my father. So I wasn't prepared for what happened next. Suddenly the room was full of energy. So, suddenly someone was there. I could sense his presence. I could feel his hands gently on my head. He was so close I found myself laying on my head laying my head on my knees like a little girl on her father's lap and near his feet. And for a long time I lay there sobbing and floating in his love. And I found myself talking with him, apologizing for not having known him before. And after a while, listen to this, she said, I reached up beside my bed and I got the Bible and the Koran side by side and I lifted them up and I said, which father, which one is your book? She said, as clearly inside me as a voice could say, spoke inside my spirit, it says, in which book did you meet me as father? From then on, she tossed the Koran and said, the Bible is the only one that is true. He is a caring father. He is a consistent father. James says he never changes. Every perfect gift comes down from the father who has no shadow of shifting, no changing. He's always the same. Now, earthly fathers aren't always the same. Sometimes they're in a good mood. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're, they're willing to give you their full attention. Sometimes they're not. But God is consistent, different. He is a giving and rewarding father. As we said, and if you look in Matthew 6, in the early part that we didn't look at, he said, if you give to the needy and don't make a big show of it, your father will see what you get in secret and reward you openly. He's a rewarding God. And he said, if you go pray, don't just pray on the street corner and everybody see how wonderful and holy you are. Go in your private place and pray and ask God. And he said, and the God who sees you, your heavenly Father, will answer. He's a close Father, not distant. It says in Acts chapter 17, God did this so people would reach out for him, reach out and find him since he's not far from each one of us. He's never too busy to care for me. It says the Lord is near to those who call upon him, Psalms 145. He loves to meet my needs. He loves to meet my needs. He said if you, you knowing how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give good gifts or give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? I read an amazing story this week. While kayaking in, the, in southern England off the coast of the Isle of Wight, Mark Ashton Smith, a lecturer from Cambridge University, capsized in the treacherous waters. Clinging to his kayak, he grabbed his cell phone some way, and you would think anybody in their right mind would call 911. He didn't. He called his dad. And it didn't matter that his father, Alan Pym Smith, was training British troops in Dubai 3,500 miles away. Without delay, the father relayed his son's mayday to the Coast Guard nearest to his son, and within 12 minutes, a helicopter came and rescued him. Like the kayaker, if we're in, we're in peril, our, our first Cry should not just be 911, give me human help, but it should be to our Heavenly Father. Because God loves to reward His children. God loves to help and give. He's even sympathetic to our hurts. He's close to those who are brokenhearted, Psalms 34 says. And He saves those who are crushed in spirit. He's a perfect Father. He's never failed. He's also a capable Father. Our fathers, when, when, maybe you remember when, you're, when you were young, your dad could do anything. There was nothing he couldn't fix. There's nothing he couldn't do anything with. My children thought I could. My daughter brought me a bird that she had dried off too well. And it wasn't moving. And she said, Dad, the bird's not moving. I was supposed to fix the bird. I couldn't fix the bird. God can fix anything we bring to him, but sometimes human parents can't. I remember driving back to Kentucky, from Kentucky to our house. We had the kids were little, and I don't know if 
is on the screen or not, the, the white Chevette, we had a little white Chevette, 1987, little four-speed. And uh, it looked a lot bigger on the screen than it actually was. <laughs> it was small. So we had this, this big topper we put on top of it. And to get all the junk that the kids needed to get home for the week, we had this, there wasn't enough room in the car, so we had this big topper we put on there. And it was hard to get on and off. And I remember often Dad would say, well, when my shift comes in, I'm going to buy you a van so that you don't have to worry that topper on top of that little Chevette. Well, his ship didn't come in, and we had a horizon. We still used the topper on top of it because it wasn't big enough. But God did provide a van later. Uh, but fathers, no matter how much they want to help, can't always fix it. God always can. He's always capable. And so, again, I say that Jesus is inviting us into his family when he says, if you want to pray, pray like this. Pray our Father. How do we get into his family? How can we call him father? Well, how do you get into the human family? You were born into it by birth, or you were adopted into it. We get into the heavenly family, Jesus said, by the same way. Not everyone is in the earthly family. There are some who are orphans. Not everyone is in God's family. There are many who are alien from God's family. But Jesus said, except a man be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus also said, if you want to get into the family, there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me in John 14, 6. It was at that point he was looking at the cross. He was knowing that he was going to, he was knowing he was going to pay the price. And he's saying, if you want to know how to get into the family of God, I want to go pay the price that he can. You can't afford it. You can't pay enough. You can't do enough to enter my family. But I want to go pay the price for you. And if you put your faith and trust in me and what I did in the death, burial, and resurrection, you can come into the family. All you have to do is believe and repent. Ephesians 1.5 says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. God wants to bring you into his family. He told me before we ever came there's at least two that he wants to bring into his family today. Are you one of those? God has already paid the price. Jesus already died. He already paid everything that is necessary if you would just turn to him. Join the Father's forever family. Live under his roof. Live by his rules. Let's pray.